Thank you, Marcus. Uh, first of all, for those of you who like to see your speakers standing up and waving their arms around, I'm afraid that you're going to have to deal with me sitting. I'm not a multitasker. I, I apologize to all the women in the audience if I've disappointed you, but uh, unfortunately, too many clickers and buttons and standing and moving pages just gets me to the point where I lose track of my thinking, and so uh, you're going to have to deal with me sitting down. First of all, I'd like to um, thank the Secretariat of the Federal Revenue of Brazil and particularly Marcus Nader for inviting me to participate in this seminar. I consider it a wonderful opportunity and I am delighted to be able to spend time with you. Unfortunately, immediately after you hear me speak, I am going to go rushing out because I uh, have to catch a plane to go back to Sao Paulo and then back to Canada very quickly. And uh, my apologies for that. Um, John, my apologies to you as well. I would have loved to hear your comments and to perhaps have one or two debates with you about uh, the US uh, position. Tomorrow, some of you will be um, afforded the opportunity to participate in working groups to further consider certain of the aspects of the interpretation and application of your role in Section 116. And I hope that you may find some of my insights into our Canadian experience in this area of uh, interest and possibly useful to you in progressing your discussions and arriving at a clear and balanced way forward for Brazil. Marcus is looking behind me to see if I've forgotten to click the clicker, but I haven't actually forgotten to click the clicker. Now, one of the impressions I had as I was listening to the speakers this morning, Professor Van Rod and our guest from Italy, was that we started, obviously, um, in, in discussing concepts that you were, uh, I, I think, very familiar with and that had uh, sim similarities and parallels to the um, Brazilian experience. Uh, as we move on in the sessions where I speak and then John speaks, I think you will notice that uh, um, North Americans perhaps talk in different terminology and I, sti I hope that the insights that we have are still going to be useful to you, but uh, I, I think part of that is that we're moving away from the civil law and civil code um, doctrine and towards uh, the common law, which, uh, much as my US friend may hesitate when I say this, is based on um, the UK law, which the um, the United Kingdom gave to the colonies, now independent. That said, Canada is a bit of a hybrid in North America because it does have both a civil law and a common law. The province of Quebec operates under civil law. The rest of Canada operates in a common law system. However, the tax law is um, almost entirely statutory, and it has evolved from principles that are um, based in, as I said a minute ago, UK uh, common law. And um, the, the legislation in Canada, the statutory legislation in the international area, has very much been designed to protect uh, the Canadian tax base from erosion. In the domestic area, much as what was being said yesterday, it is designed to assure that taxpayers in um, transacting among themselves produce a reasonable result and that as well um, taxpayers pay their fair burden of the taxes. There, prior to the GAR, there were very few statutory anti-avoidance rules. I've listed them on the slide here, and you can take a look at them if, they're, um, if it's interesting to you. Um, primarily, um, 
even though taxpayers engaging in business were required to file financial statements, the system in Canada was not and continues not to be based on accounting or financial statement characterizations either of transactions or of items of income. So it's very important to note some of the differences between the Brazilian system and the Canadian system before we get into our chat. Now, Marcus has asked that I spend a, a bit of time on the pre-GAR judicial anti-avoidance doctrines. Um, prior to the GAR, as one can imagine, we started from a, a system which again was based on UK common law. And uh, basically our principle was, and I think someone actually even said it in relation to the Brazilian tax system yesterday, that every man is entitled to order his affairs to pay the least tax possible and should not be blamed for doing so. That was the basic premise of the Canadian system. Added to that were a number of pre-guard judicial anti-avoidance doctrines. I've listed them here. We'll talk a little bit about each of them, not much, because uh, they're very similar to what's already been said by a number of the speakers. Um, two have survived and are used as supplements to the GAR, that being the doctrine of sham and the um, the, the treatment of transactions as incomplete or legally ineffective. That is not part of our guard, but actually a supplement and an alternative to challenge a transaction. Um, the two of the other ones, the business purpose test and the step transaction doctrine, have actually survived in some form and been integrated into our general anti-avoidance rules. So um, I, I um, we'll go through them very quickly. The, the, the first one being the doctrine of sham. Um, from a UK perspective, you see the first quote up there, and I'm not going to read quotes to you, but uh, um, I did, um, I, I, I think my slides will be available to all of you on request uh, after my session. Um, basically, sham from a UK perspective means acts done, documents executed, which are intended by the parties to give third parties the appearance of creating legal rights that are different from the actual legal rights and obligations the parties intend to create. Well, what does that mean? The simple classical um, example that's always given under UK law is you have Mr. A and Mr. B. Mr. A wishes to sell his property to Mr. B. Um, Mr. B wants to buy the property. But if Mr. A sells the property, he's going to be taxed. So what does he do? Mr. B makes a loan to Mr. A. The loan is without recourse except to the property. The loan is without interest. The loan is for a term of 99 years. Mr. A then transfers the property to Mr. B as security for that loan. And in the olden days, um, some, I, somebody was talking this morning about old, and old countries, now in the olden days, uh, when the tax systems weren't quite so sophisticated, that would allow for an avoidance of tax. And what was happening there? A and B were actually entering into a sale contract, but they were documenting it as if it was a loan transaction. And that is the classic example of a sham. There has to be an element of, de of deceit. And in the Canadian law, deceit is an absolute necessity. And um, if you look at um, the slides that the Supreme Court of Canada expressly rejected in the Canadian context, the integration with the concept of sham of a business purpose test. And the finance uh, department in Canada found that the doctrine of sham was very narrow and very limited in its application and did not use it often only because it was so difficult to prove deceit in a situation where parties had actually contracted and designed their documents to achieve exactly the legal result that they had intended. <clears throat> 